so, uh, if you want to open your Bibles to Psalm 93, um, we're going to spend some time there this morning. It was funny, well, not funny, I don't know. As somebody who preaches every once in a while, I might appreciate this more than you, but uh, when Mark had first talked to me about, uh, Mark Marvel, that is, uh, had talked to me about preaching, he said, you've done this before, right? Like, you, you could probably pull something out of the file. And I was like, whoops. Uh, yeah, yeah, I can do that. I, I'll probably, I have something I could probably whip out. And then I had a conversation with my roommate, Ben Tabone, and I think he was the first one who said, uh, oh, come on, you could do something new. And I was like, eh, it's tight. You know, I'm working a job. I can't necessarily put in 20 hours of sermon prep or something like that. And lo and behold, I ended up doing something new. So um, I'm happy to preach from Psalm 93. It's actually a psalm that I read uh, probably back in June as I was uh, up at camp and, and still sort of preparing for the summer months of summer camp. And um, it just smacked me with a, a vision of the sovereignty and kingship of God that I want to try to share with you. So um, let me read the psalm for us, and I'm reading from the English Standard Version, and then I'll pray and we'll dive in together. Psalm 93 says this, The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed. He has put on strength as His belt. Yes, the the world is established. It shall never be moved. Your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. The floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their roaring. Mightier than the thunders of many waters. Mightier than the waves of the sea. The Lord on high is mighty. Your decrees are very trustworthy. Holiness befits your house, O Lord, forevermore. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this psalm written thousands of years ago and yet speaks so powerfully even today. We pray that you would, by your spirit, work in our hearts and minds to open them, to understand, to give us insight into your word, and also that we would see that its meaning for us, that we would feel its truths in our hearts, and that we would live uh, as though we believe them. In Jesus' name, amen. So the central idea of, of Psalm 93 is stated right at the beginning there. It says, the Lord reigns, or just as appropriately translated, the Lord is king. The Lord is king. God's kingship over all things, his sovereignty and power, his authority and dominion is the organizing theme of Psalm 93. But before we go any further, I I need to talk for a moment about the nature of our passage this morning, Uh, namely its its genre, that it is poetry, um, and how God communicates truth to us through this kind of passage. In Psalm 93, there are no commands, there are no exhortations, there are no words of the wise or proverbs. It's not a paragraph in a, a letter from Paul. It's not a parable in a gospel or a narrative from some Old Testament book. It's rather a psalm, a song, we might even say. It's a meditation on God and His reign and rule. It is poetry in your Bible. It's probably, even as it's printed in your Bible, you see it's sort of indented in different ways. It looks different than uh, something from 2 Samuel or a letter from Paul. Our Bible translators and editors show us this. Psalm 93 is theology proper in poetic verse. It's systematic theology in meter and rhyme, although it doesn't rhyme very well in English. Imagine you could read, you know, a big 250 pages of uh, a book on theology, a theology textbook about God, or you could read five verses from Psalm 93 of poetic imagination. Both are about God. Both communicate truth, but they communicate that truth in a slightly different way. The emotional and intellectual impact they have is quite different. And for that reason, we have to approach Psalm 93 as such. Think about the, the way uh, your favorite song or poem, if you happen to read poetry, uh, impacts you, affects you when you hear it or listen to it in the car. How it 
opens your imagination and gives light to your eyes and warms your heart to see and savor reality, to grasp truth, to feel love and hate, apprehension and hope. I think of a song like a Good, Good Father. I don't know if you guys have sung that here or not, but uh, the, the chorus goes, you're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. The words themselves are fairly straightforward, but somehow they communicate something. They make us feel something. Even as I'm talking about it, I'm getting goosebumps. They, they make us feel God's love and care for us. Or another song that I love very much, uh, an old hymn called It Is Well. Uh, one of the verses of that hymn goes, My sin, oh the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, was nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O oh, my soul. And so, as much as poetry, and Psalm 93 in particular, deals with truth, it communicates it in a way that transcends mere vocabulary and grammar. The whole psalm together and every line that composes it speaks with a, a beauty and power that somehow exceeds what it is in itself. And as a preacher, a teacher, somebody who's going to share this with others, I feel the need to preach it that way. As I was preparing, I was thinking, uh, going through my process and everything, and thinking, you know, what are my applications? What are my main points? What am I going to say? All that sort of thing. And while I did come up with some, uh, I, I need to be careful not to m make moral injunctions to, to command you to do something when, when there isn't necessarily a command here. Like I said, there are no commands, no exhortations in the psalm. But that's not to say that Psalm 93 doesn't impact our lives. It's not to say it doesn't compel us to change or our attitudes or behavior. It very much does. But it does so implicitly. It does so by painting a picture for us. It does so by giving us a vision of God to behold. And having seen God, we walk away a very different person than when we came. As Charles Spurgeon, a great preacher, back in the day, wrote, What can give greater joy to a loyal subject than a sight of the king in his beauty? What can give greater joy to a loyal subject than a sight of the king in his beauty? Let us repeat the proclamation, The Lord reigneth, whispering it in the ears of the desponding and publishing it in the face of the foe. So that's what I want to do this morning, to give you a, a sight of the king in his beauty, the high king over the flood. But some things are more caught than taught, and I pray that you will catch this vision, the vision of a big, sovereign God who's the king of the universe, who's the king over all princes and powers of things natural and supernatural, over things present and things to come, a vision that is perhaps more than I can actually articulate, but one that is no less real and true. So with that, let's, let's dive into Psalm 93. Uh, there is no, uh, we, we don't know exactly when Psalm 93 was written. We don't really know who exactly wrote it. We're not told uh, by the psalm itself uh, any of that information. We don't really know the circumstances of the author and uh, his writing. All we have is what the psalm itself says. And verse 3 presents the immediate problem in the psalm. Verse 3 says, the floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their roaring. And that's the, the pressing question of the psalm is, who can reign over the flood? Who can master the waves of the sea? Think about it. In the ancient world, floods were bad news. Okay? In the ancient world, civilizations were founded near rivers. Rivers, for instance, like uh, the Nile River in Egypt, or the Euphrates or Tigris River in the Mesopotamian region, or even in Israel, the Jordan River. It runs down the, east, the eastern side of Israel. But uh, rain and moderate flooding of these rivers was necessary for cultivation of crops and growth and life. But too much water, too much flooding, and... Pfft, 
towns, cities, villages, farms just would be decimated. And even in our 3,000 years or so since the psalm was probably written, we've really not come all that far in terms of uh, mastering these natural forces. Even look around. We were reminded of this recently in our nation. Uh, Look at Texas. Look at Florida. Look at even uh, the wildfires in, in California. The devastation is immense and breathtaking. And there's largely nothing we can do about it. These are forces beyond our control. We as human beings are utterly incapable of mastering or ruling over these forces. And thus the pressing question, who can reign over the flood? The answer to the question and the the consolation, the comfort of Psalm 93 is this. The Lord is king over the flood. The Lord reigns forever over the flood. Verse 4 tells us, mightier than the thunders of many waters, mightier than the waves of the sea, the Lord on high is mighty. Even the greatest, most devastating, most earth-destructing flood is nothing but a a kiddie pool that God rests His feet in on a summer day. So, there are three affirmations that will sort of frame my exposition of the psalm. The first affirmation is this. Affirmation number one. The Lord reigns as King forever. The Lord reigns as King forever. Verses 1 and 2. The psalm uh, opens with this declaration. As I already read, the Lord reigns. The Lord is king. It's not Baal, one of these uh, foreign, ancient foreign gods. It's not Pharaoh. Pharaoh is not king. Allah is not king. Vishnu or Krishna, Donald Trump or Vladimir Putin, none of these are king. It's not Mao Zedong or Adolf Hitler. Not even the great one, Muhammad Ali. Or any other celebrity or movie or sports star. <laughs> or it has a mildly inflated self-image. And it's not you. You are not king. Me. I'm not king. The Lord reigns. And the psalmist, he goes on and he pictures the Lord putting on His royal garb, as it were. And in verse 1, he goes on, he says, He is robed, He is clothed in majesty. It's not very often that Scripture sort of talks about God's clothing. God putting on things. Uh, One other place it does it is in Psalm 104. In Psalm 104, it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, You are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty, covering Yourself with light as with a garment. But how, how do we in our culture or whatever symbolize status or nobility via fashion or clothing? We might use... Uh, certain colors like gold or purple or scarlet. Uh, we might use fine linens and materials to symbolize status. What about God? What does God, the high king, wear? The psalmist says, God wears majesty. God puts on majesty as a robe. I was just talking to uh, one of my coworkers at camp this morning, sort of giving him a short version of what I was talking about. And I, I told him, you, you can't just read that. I mean, you can. But it, it, it takes a moment for that vision to hit you and sink in. What does it look like to wear majesty? I don't really know, but that's what God's like. That's what God the King is like. He, he, he's robed in majesty. The psalmist goes on. The, the Lord is robed. He's put on Strength as his belt. The ESV takes a little bit of liberty in adding as his belt uh, to its translation, but it's not not a bad addition. More literally, we might say from the Hebrew, it it is uh, God is girded himself with strength. This this verb girded is the same verb that um, in the book of Job, if you want to flip there. I don't know how familiar you are with the book of Job, but in in Job chapter 38 and 40, God um, has it out with Job, if you will. But he tells him, 
in Job 38, 3, dress for action like a man. I will question you, and you make it known to me. And our Bibles, again, sort of play with the translation here. Dress for action like a man. More literally, it is, gird up your loins like a man. I will question you, and you will make it known to me. That is to say, strap in, because I'm about to bring something to you, Job. If God's outer garments are majesty, His undergarments are strength. I was thinking as I was preparing, my, my dad has this, this bold, bright red tie, right? He calls it his power tie. You know, sometimes you see politicians or whatever, and they come out, nice white shirt, red tie, blue suit. It's a, it's a power tie. Give me a break. My God wears strength for boxers <laughs> and majesty as his coat. That's a power tie. But can you see the glory of God as king? And and not only does the psalmist picture uh, the Lord as king through his dress, but he also describes his his throne as he goes on in verse 2. And he emphasizes God's eternality. The second half of verse 1, he says, Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. Your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting The world and its establishment highlights the Lord's power as creator and king of the universe. And notice that there's a connection, I think, that the psalmist is drawing between the world and God's throne. He uses the same verb here. uh, The world is established. And in verse 2, your throne is established. And the connection is something like this. Sure, sure, the, the world is established, but your throne stands immovable forever. From ages long ago, your throne is from old. And what's more, as he continues, the Lord himself is from everlasting. In Psalm 90, verse 2, the psalmist says something similar. He says, before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, You are God. God's throne is established from of old. He is from everlasting. Who's like that? This brings to mind even Daniel's vision. In Daniel chapter 7, he has this vision of what he calls the Ancient of Days. The Ancient of Days sits upon his throne and one like a son of man comes before him and The ancient of days gives to the Son of Man His throne, and this is all a vision of of God seated on His throne and Christ, the Son of Man, coming and receiving a kingdom. But who else is like this? Only the Lord. Only the Lord reigns as King forever. Affirmation number two. The Lord reigns over the flood. The Lord reigns over the flood. The floods may rise, but the mightier is the Lord on high. In verses 3 and 4, this repetition, the floods have lifted up, the floods have lifted up, the floods have lifted up three times. It builds the the tension and the, the danger that is pictured. And likewise, the repetition of mightier in verse 4, mightier than the thunders of many waters, mightier than the waves of the sea, the Lord on high. Is mighty. Emphasizes the the triumph and power of the Lord over the waters. Just picture for a moment, and close your eyes if you want to, the Lord putting on his royal garb, taking his seat upon his throne, high and lifted up. His throne is is elevated above all else in sight, and the waters below begin to swirl and roar. They rise and crash against the base of the Lord's throne, so much so that they begin to nip His toes while the train of His robe is sprayed by the crash of the waves. Any moment it seems like the waters might overtake Him. It's the kind of picture 
the psalmist is, is painting, that vision of the Lord. And, and here's the truth of the matter. In the midst of that scenario, the Lord reigns over the flood. He remains seated on His throne, unmoved, unconcerned, neither taken back nor surprised by the waves, but completely in control of the situation. With a word, He can still the waves and vanquish the storm. Psalm 89 says, O Lord, God of hosts, who is mighty as You are, O Lord? With Your faithfulness all around You, You rule the raging of the sea when its waves rise. You still them. But through it all, whether God stills the waves or lets them roll, He remains king over the flood. Psalm 29, verse 10 says, The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. The Lord is king over the flood Affirmation number three. The Lord is faithful and holy. Verse five, it says, Your decrees are very trustworthy. Holiness befits your house, O Lord, forevermore. Here again is the the difference between poetry and prose. How, How are you supposed to say God is faithful, He can be believed, and He is holy without saying God's faithful and holy? How do you picture that? How do you Make that come across. Faithful and holy is systematic theology. Your decrees are very trustworthy, and holiness befits your house. That's poetry. In other words, God's Word can be believed and relied upon. It is a lamp to our feet and a light unto our path. He does not lead us astray. He does not promise but not provide. All that He says proves true. God is faithful. His decrees are very trustworthy. And God's house, His dwelling place, what is it like? Let me put it this way. Holiness is a fitting decor. What does holiness decor look like? I don't know. What does a robe of majesty look like? If a person's dwelling says anything about the person, then God's house is decorated with holiness because God is holy. Have you seen the king in his beauty this morning? Have you savored the wonder, the majesty, and the glory of the the high king over the flood? The God, the God of Psalm 93 is the God of the Bible, the whole Bible. Moreover, Jesus Christ is the God of Psalm 93. And I don't know, I don't know much of a a better way than, than to, better way to connect Jesus Christ as the God of the Bible to Psalm 93, then to tell you a story. It comes out of the Gospel of Mark. Mark chapter 4. The other Gospels recorded as well, but there's a story of Christ calming the waves of the sea. I'm not going to read uh, Mark's telling of it. There's a, uh, an admittedly amplified retelling of uh, Mark chapter 4 that I want to read for you that I came across. So this is, this is not God's Word, but it's a, um, like sight and sound. You know, the, the, the theater that does the biblical productions, it's kind of like that. But here it goes. The shadows of the hilltops surfed across the lake as the sun descended and evening came. As the disciples joined Jesus in the boat, Andrew and Philip grabbed the oars. Judas and Bartholomew ca- uh, gave the boat a final heave from shore and hopped in. Everyone was set for a quiet evening trip to the eastern shore. James and John sat together in the bow, ardently discussing Jesus' ramblings about mustard seeds and the kingdom of God. The others reclined against the sides of the boat and enjoyed the cool breeze. James, the son of Alphaeus, reached his hands behind him, stretching back 
so that they skipped across the crest of the wake. Andrew, true to form, slapped the oar against the water, splashing Peter and nearly getting Jesus. Without a moment's hesitation, Peter gave him a brotherly shove that knocked Andrew off his feet and butt first onto the floor of the boat. Thaddeus bellowed as the others joined in laughter. It wasn't long before the deep blues and burnt oranges of the skyline were overcome by clouds of an eerie shade of gray. Suddenly, the wind picked up, howling like a mother in mourning. Drops of water peppered the faces of the disciples like bee stings, and the boat began to rock as the waves began to grow. The relaxed and merry character of the twelve quickly turned uneasy and apprehensive. Even the seasoned fishermen of the bunch shot anxious glances at one another, unsure of what was to come. A seven-foot swell approached rapidly. Incoming, shouted Simon with a surprising screech of a ten-year-old. The wave crashed over the starboard side, sending Matthew across to the port and into James's lap. Before anyone could say a word, another wave did the same. Good heavens, gargled Thaddeus, coughing up a mouthful of water. The disciples tried to keep their heads down because of the wind, but the waves were unrelenting. They continued to pour in over the sides, and the boat began to fill. James and John furiously led the charge to scoop out the water, but their efforts were showing little potential to keep up with the onslaught of water. Thomas scurried about the boat on his hands and knees, encouraging the others and trying to be optimistic about their present circumstances. That is, until he was hit from behind with a wave that drove his forehead to the floor and left him with a nasty bruise. He was never quite the same. Peter was not hopeful about the situation. He was watching his closest friends frantically fighting in what seemed like the fight of their lives. He peered over the side of the boat, and to his horror, the horizon was non-existent. He could hardly see beyond ten cubits in front of him. He looked back at the eleven, paused, and counted again. Where was Jesus? Peter spun about in the blink of an eye and spotted Jesus in the stern, lying on a cushion, asleep. He grabbed the two closest to him by the arm and darted to Jesus' side. Each of them dropped to his knees and shook Jesus the way a child does his mother when he's had a nightmare. When he woke, they cried, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? At that moment, all the disciples turned and looked at Jesus. He stared back at them, looking deep into their eyes. In an instant, he shined a light into their souls like a torch in a cave, exposing their fear and bringing to light their unbelief. Silently, he stood up. He turned away from the twelve and faced the storm. The water in the boat surpassed his ankles as the wind beat against his face and the waves sprayed across his chest. He commanded the wind and the waves with a strong but soothing tone, peace, be still. Immediately, there was a great calm. It was as though time stood still. A power went out from Jesus that seemed to suspend all calamity while bringing a a sweet serenity to everything within earshot. His words reverberated across the lake, silencing the wind and stopping the waves. In a moment, cosmic chaos became supernatural shalom. When all was quiet, the disciples were speechless. None of them could muster a word while the wind and the waves worshipped. Then Jesus turned back to the twelve and said, Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? His rebuke cut them to the heart, yet the impact was Blunted like a hammer that strikes a nail but doesn't drive it in. The fear of the storm was now, their fear of the storm was now redirected at Jesus with exceeding haste, and they were not sure how to respond. With the storm over, the twelve were able to scoop out the remaining water from the boat. As they finished up and got going in the right direction again, they couldn't help but ask one another, Who is this that even the wind and the waves? Obey him. Who is this? 
You can ask the same thing of Psalm 93. Who is this king? Who is this God who reigns over the flood? It is none other than Jesus Christ. None other than the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so, I'm just going to close with a, a real brief sort of application. Three things I think Psalm 93 compels us to do. Psalm 93 compels us to be steadfast through trial because the Lord is in control. He is king over the flood. He sits enthroned over the waves. And we can remain steadfast because we know that He is there. Psalm 93 compels us to be faithful through affliction because we know we can trust the Lord. It compels us to, to, to continue believing, continue placing our trust in Him because He is proven trustworthy. And finally, it compels us through all things to be holy because the Lord is holy. His holiness demands our holiness. I don't know all that much about Winchester. I don't know all that much about any of you. And where you're at in life, what kind of troubles or trials or afflictions, what sort of relationship tensions or family issues or job issues you might be beating your head against. Whatever your flood is, the Lord is king over the flood. He is king over your flood. Charles Spurgeon once again wrote, Jehovah reigns is the first word and the main doctrine of the psalm, and holiness is the final result. A due esteem of the great king will lead us to adopt a behavior becoming of his royal presence. Divine sovereignty both confirms the promises and sure testimonies and enforces the precepts as seemly and becoming in the presence of so great a, a Lord. And so I close with this. The Lord reigns. The Lord is king forever. The Lord reigns forever over the flood. May our high king give us the grace to live like we believe it. Let's pray.